All right, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for coming to another lecture here at the museum. A uh, couple things to remind you before we get started. You can still buy chances on the quilt you see over here. Uh, and I looked in there and we still got at least two more colors, so you can pick which one you get. Uh, don't forget about the trip on October 5th. If you want to go to Wilson, Arkansas with us on a bus, you can sign up out at the front desk. And then we have one last lecture after this. Next week, uh, Johnny Archer will be here telling uh, comical stories, I hope, about the real estate business and her many years in that and her dad's many years in that. So tonight we have um, an interesting speaker who I'm happy to introduce to you. Um, I knew, I feel like I've known you forever. Uh, first of all, she was just Heather's mom. I graduated with one of her daughters. I um, was very good friends with Heather. I don't see her very often anymore. But, And then I've one of my fondest memories, maybe not the outcome of the night, but one of my fondest memories was that this young Republican boy was invited to their house to watch the 1992 presidential returns <laughs> by my friend Heather. I, d I didn't leave very happy, but, but I had a good time. I don't know if you can remember that. Yes! <laughs> Such a joyous night as that was. Well, we can argue about that later, but... You got even. <laughs> so, later on. Anyway. And then I got to know her a little bit when I went to BRTC for a year. And we all know everything she's done at BRTC. If they needed it done, she's done it. So without anything else, let me introduce Dr. Jan Ziegler. Thank you, Rodney. I had, I had sort of forgotten that, that night, but uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a great memory. Uh, before I begin, I no longer am officially in the capacity at, at Black River Technical College, but unless they kick me out the door, I'm always going to feel a closeness to that institution. And so what I would like to do is pass around a sign-in sheet because they have assisted tonight with the technology and we are, um, I'm asking you to sign this sheet because then their uh, corporate and community education program will be able to include this to show what this community is doing for community education. So thank you for signing that and I appreciate Black River Technical College for the technical assistance. I'm so happy each of you is here tonight. I've been looking forward to this since Rodney invited me some time ago to, to talk about something of importance in Randolph County history. And, and I thought this might be something that, well, as, as John Jackson reminded me, I don't know squat about baseball. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, this is a special piece of baseball history. And, and I'm especially glad that he's here tonight, too, because those difficult questions, if they come, I know right where I'm going to send those. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me okay? <laughs> the scorching July 4th sun bears down on the field at Burdell. Pearl Young and, and others carried the toe sack faces around to distribute them on the diamond. This was the heart of the so-called Little Africa community in the gently rolling hills of this overwhelmingly white uh, area of Arkansas. But to the hundred or so black residents of Burdell, it was just home. The field is in good shape, Pearl notices proudly. He and his mule team, Belle and Dinah, have seen to that, and already the crowd is starting to gather. Some of the old benches, they're already full, and mothers are spreading their quilts underneath the huge oak trees. Other children cluster, looking around to see who's arriving in the wagons, or the old cars, or on foot to the road leading to the Burdell Church, near where the field is located. There will be, no doubt, spectators from other places in the county where African-American population existed in that time and for sure from Pocahontas. In all, the black population of Randolph County in those days, and by those days I'm talking about the 30s and the 40s, 
is estimated at less than 500 or about 3% of the population of the county. A sizable number of the black community will be there for the game today, Pearl Young knows, as he stops to survey the scene and take in the aroma of the roasted pig that is being prepared. They'd be just rowed up people on those benches and on the ground, you know, sitting on the grass, things like that, and they would get so involved in the ball game, Roland McCarroll remembers. The rules weren't as strict then as they are now, and those older people, especially the men, well, not really old men, I thought they were then, he said, they would be so involved in the game, pulling for their teams, just keep crowding the lines, and after a while, they'd be on the fields, down at the baseline, from third base to home plate. Well, they'd have to stop the game and kindly get them back, and finally, they roped it off, put up a rope just so close, but it wouldn't stay up long, they'd tear it down. So, hold on to that image of Pearl Young and the mules dragging the field and setting the stakes to hold back the fans, getting ready for the big game. And let's broaden out our view for a moment and take a quick look at the sport of baseball on a larger field, Sounds the odd. national field, going back to the years leading up to the Civil War. Sam, the sound's off, and we can't hear you very well. David, the sound is off. Sound's off. <coughs> Excuse me for interrupting. But no, thank you. Just speak louder? Mm -hmm. or? No, it went off, David. It went off. Yeah, it went off. Okay, Jan, do your best. <coughs> without okay. <coughs> you can use, she can, she can use the handheld. David, she can hmm? use the handheld if she wants to. Yeah. But she's got too many hands. I mean, too much to do. <laughs> <laughs> in Hoboken, New York. Throughout the 50s, baseball clubs sprung up all throughout the New York area and beyond. Mark Twain, one of my favorite writers, described it this way. Baseball is the very symbol, the outward and visible expression of the drive and push, the rush and struggle of the raging, tearing, booming 19th century. He could not have known then just how true his depiction of the sport of baseball and of the nation would prove to be. As a result of the Civil War, the sport of baseball, as you know, spread throughout the country. Union soldiers brought it with them to the front lines and it reached the far corners of the nation. In a bit of irony, um, Union soldiers actually played against Confederate guards and so at a time when our nation was politically divided, it was united culturally by the emerging national pastime. Well, I'm, I'm skimming over and compressing the years now, but suffice it to say that in the years after the Civil War, baseball continued to grow in popularity throughout the country until some people actually believe that across America, baseball was one of the strongest bonds holding the nation together. But that's just part of the story, because here's what else was happening. Baseball was embedded in American and American culture, in American culture, um, and it mirrored in several respects, the main one being segregation. Because of this segregationist policy, black ball players, as you know, were forced to form their own teams. Over time, a whole subculture of black ball emerged, and it became known as the Negro Leagues. African American baseball, or the Negro Leagues, were active largely between 1920 and the late 40s, when black players were at last contracted to play major and minor league baseball. The principal Negro Leagues 
were the Negro National League, the Eastern Colored League, and the Negro American League. And each year, black teams and the clubs, the minor clubs that would emerge out of this, took to the road in the early spring. And from then until late fall, they played a ball game almost every day, meeting black teams and white teams in farm villages, large cities, on sand lots, and in major league stadiums. In the winter, they even went to Florida and Cuba and Mexico, and so that the Negro baseball was played year-round in this event that they called barnstorming. As baseball fever spread across the country, communities everywhere organized their own teams, and these teams played in the nearby towns or neighborhoods in this sport that we have come to call sandlot baseball. And that happened here. That happened here. What also happened here, just like in the nation overall, was the segregation of the sport. Jim Crow demanded, and we complied. This reality gave rise to a local team, an amazing team, an all-black team whose existence in the 1930s and the 1940s literally transcended just entertainment. It was so much more than that. It's, it's the story of this Sandlot team known at that time as the, the Burdell Colored Boys that I want to share with you tonight. This is the story as it was relayed to me by one of our own, and I truly am convinced, one of our county's most important, most influential athletes in the sport of baseball, and that is the late Roland McCarroll. Many of you knew him. I see nods. Yeah. I sat down with him and his wife, Miss Helen, and with her friend, Myrtle Johnson of Biggers, in what is today the Eddie May Heron Center. Guys, I hate to admit this, but this was nearly 40 years ago, <laughs> in about 1978. And I was doing a research project for my graduate independent study class on folklore and storytelling. And Mr. Rowland was sharing his memories and his stories of baseball with helpful reminders from Miss Helen and Miss Myrtle. Mr. Rowland was born in 1921, and he began his ball playing career at about age nine or 10 in the early 30s. And as we all know, baseball on the national scene with what was happening here following suit, um, changed forever with the crossing of the color line by Jackie Robinson in 46-47. And so the time frame that, that we covered then in that interview and that I'm going to be covering tonight is that, that period, that interlude, 1930s and 40s. So now once again, let's broaden out our lens to... Um, look at the national scene and what was playing out there with some of the legendary players because it does have relevance for our story here locally as well. Those years gave us such legendary greats as this player, Satchel Page. He was just an amazing pitcher who was the first from the Negro League selected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. According to the stories and legends, Satchel Page would would sometimes just wave his whole outfield. Y'all come on into the dugout. I'm not going to need you. I'm going to strike this guy out. Just come on in. And um, his fastball, they called a bee ball because it hummed like a bee. And then there was this character, this real person, Cool Papa Bell. He was often called the fastest man on earth ever to play baseball. He rode this speed of his and his colorful nick nickname right into the Hall of Fame. And his teammate, Satchel Page, once said that Bell was so fast that he could switch the light in their hotel room and jump into bed before the light went out. <laughs> Rumor also had it that Bell had once been called out because he got hit by his own ball 
while rounding second base. <laughs> and I don't doubt it. <laughs> well, Roland McCarroll would have been well aware of these stories about these men who were somewhat his heroes. And he kept this copy of a newspaper article about these legendary players. And all those men I just mentioned are in, in that particular picture. So the thing is, the Negro League may have had its cool Papa Bell, but the Burdell team could not have been prouder of one of its own, as Roland relayed to me that day. We had a man, Roland continued, Charlie Johnson, real tall he was. Back then, six foot man, we thought real tall. But he was tall. He was six and a half, I guess. Could have been seven. <laughs> he was the tallest man in the county and the fastest man. I didn't see him play until he was maybe 35 years old, but I never saw a guy, I believe, could run as fast as he could. He could catch a rabbit, just outrun a rabbit and catch him. He just loved to gloat. He knew he could run and everyone bragged and he lived over at Inboden. But this day out to Burdell, I saw this. They was playing and he was on first base and he left and went on to second. And between second and third, he really reared back then whole group of men was sitting on the ground up by third base on the grass, and they saw him coming. And he was just right on them. That man could, I n never saw anyone that could run as fast as he could. Just an old country boy, you know, just nature. He could run. And Pearl Young's wife's little kid, three or four years old, these kids was out there, you know, and when Charlie turned third to go home, all those guys, they didn't have time to get up and get out of his way. He was running so fast, they just laid down on the ground, and he just jumped. I guess it looked like he jumped half as far as from here to that door. He was running so fast. And she begun to holler, Oh, Charlie! I'm behind one here. Yeah, yeah. And she began to holler, Oh, Charlie, don't run over my little baby. Don't. Charlie gonna run over my baby. And this kid couldn't get out of the way. He just picked this kid up in his arms and just went on across the way. I saw that. I saw he was going to run over the kid, but he just scooped her up and kept running and scored with the kid in his arms. And all the fans, did they ever! In addition to their own legendary Charlie Johnson, the Burdell team had a lineup to match the crowd's enthusiasm. And I need to stop here and acknowledge a lot of assistance I received in locating these photos in tonight's presentation. Some of them were in the archives at the Eddie May Heron Center, and some are from the personal photo collection of Margaret McCarroll, and a lot of help I received also from Mary McCarroll, who is Roland and Miss Helen's daughter, and, and a lot of help from Pat Johnson, and I appreciate all of you all so very much. Well, there was Sam Williford, and Sunny Man Walter Oaks, and Pony and Skeet Williford. There was Staten Shockley, Ed Young, and you gotta love the names, Fat Jack Lonzo Thomas, <laughs> and old Ernest McCarroll and Little Ernest, along with Crockett Oaks. I didn't know him, but they say he always had his cowboy boots and his hat on, as he does in this picture. Is that right, Laura? Yes. Yeah. And there was uh, John Shockley and Smokey James. Well, Pearl Young would use George Bush. I didn't get a picture of him, but George Bush. Uh, and he knew he'd be needing schoolboy Roland McCarroll today. Everybody knew schoolboy was just a natural-born player. Just a natural-born player. Well, natural or not, Roland McCarroll was one of six children in the McCarroll family, and times were hard 
for them as for everyone in Randolph County in the 30s and 40s. Bill McCarroll needed Rowan's help on the family farm, working alongside his parents and his sisters and his brother. There were hogs and cattle and chickens to tend and crops to work, the corn, the cotton, and the hay. The eight of them lived in a two-room cabin, and Rowan's father just couldn't see the value of his boys spending time on ball playing when there was work to be done. Nevertheless, as often as he could, on holidays and, and sometimes Saturday afternoons, Roland would trade his plow for a ball and bat, aided and abetted in doing so by Pearl Young. In those times, he would join the Burdell team for another round of sport. Roland McCarroll actually began playing with the older members of the Burdell Colored Boys team when he was just a boy. Actually, not much more than nine or ten, subbing at first. But by the time he was 15, schoolboy was playing with the men. An accomplishment that you might think would thrill many a father, but not in this case. My dad, he didn't care much about sports. He just wanted us to work. That man that lived by us, Pearl Young, he was managing the team. I guess he helped us out a lot, see? He would come to our place. My dad's name was Bill, and he'd say, Now, Bill, I need your boys today. That was Ernest and me. And we were good ball players. We were just kids, but we were good ball players. He'd say, I got a hard game coming up over the weekend. He'd mention that early in the week, and we'd just be trying to see just how much work could we do because so we might get to go and play ball. Many times he didn't let us go. Had to stay home and work, but he would sometimes. That week, he just begged my daddy, let the boys go with me. And he'd follow my dad begging him, and my daddy, Bill McCarroll, would say, Go on now, I'm not going to let them go. We got this to do, and we got that to do. And sometimes, from the goodness of my mother, she would say to him, Bill, why don't you let the boys go? They've been working hard. Why don't you let them go, Bill? And sometimes they talk him into it. He might let us go. When I got up about 16 years old, it got better. You know, people was bragging about what a good ball player I was till he let up, McCarroll related. But even when he let up, Roland McCarroll's father only sometimes, but not very often, went to see the magic of the Burdell Colored Boys and his sons. <coughs> he just didn't care to, Mr. Roland said. So compelling was his desire to play baseball that Roland McCarroll occasionally went against his father's wishes particularly when it came to Sunday games. It seems that the black community was divided about the propriety of games on the Lord's Day, but Bill McCarroll absolutely drew the line there. Besides, the New Friendship Church was located not more than a stone's throw from the ball field. Can you imagine the hallelujah and praise the Lord and yay go? That would have been quite a mixture. Uh, and the services would still be underway when the game started. Sometimes on Sunday afternoon, we really wanted to go, but we didn't get to, Roland McCarroll explained. Sometimes, you know, I was a hard loser. Still am. The boys would be losing, and they'd want me to come in. I'd hold back till finally I'd go in and get hurt or crippled up when the game was over. And if there was the devil to pay later, it did not matter that much to Roland McCarroll. There was this pride and camaraderie and the sense of belonging, being needed by the team. I caught it. I sure did. But I don't know. It was just something I liked. I just played. When I got to be about 16 years old, I would go out of town. And maybe sometimes the boys from Walnut Ridge would come and get me. And we go places like Paragool, Jonesboro, Newport, those real good teams. And they would cripple me up, those older men, because <laughs> I, I was good and they wanted to get me out of the game. And we were farmers. And I'd be laid up for weeks at a time. Couldn't work. 
boy, wasn't he proud of me then. Yeah. But whatever the consequences, and they were not mild, McCarroll, Roland McCarroll said the price was not too great for the satisfaction of getting to play. Clearly, the sport on that sandlot, as in the cities where the Negro Leagues met, meant more than just recreation. It also meant recognition. On the playing field, thanks to the exuberance of the fans and what Roland McCarroll called showboating of the players, these men were somebody caught up in the excitement of the spectators who filled the benches and the pallets spread in the shade. When they rounded the bases, the Burdell colored boys usually did so wearing their plow shoes and striped overalls and maybe a gingham shirt and a striped railroad hat. Not, uh, and that's according to Miss Helen and Miss Myrtle. The 4th of July, now that was something special. They explained, and that wasn't just because of the ball game, which brought together the black residents from several communities, but also because the 4th of July game usually extended into a picnic and a dance party. I know they always had a bunch over on the 4th of July, Myrtle Johnson said, and they had a picnic and they would barbecue hogs. They would put up a great big thing and put leaves, tree limbs to make it shady under there. And they would take that and make a place where the man, whoever it was at that time, it was Will Mansco, he was real good for barbecuing. And he would get that stuff started, and then they would sell that while they were having the ball game. Well, that would be the picnic for the 4th of July. They'd set it up early in the afternoon, and it would be ready by the morning of the 4th. And then the proceeds from the barbecue would help buy equipment for the team. Miss Helen remembered that sometimes then they would have a dance the night after the ball game, but not all members of the black community had a chance to share in the fun, according to Myrtle Johnson. In fact, the girls in her family, they just weren't allowed to go many places, including to the ball games and also not to the dances that followed. Not that I didn't want to, she explained, because I was a young girl, and hearing of a dance, I thought that was grand. Oh, boy. But if I spoke up, and some of the other kids come by and ask me about it, I didn't have to say nothing. All I had to do was look around the corner and see where my grandpa was. And he wasn't <laughs> never far away, I'll tell you. And most especially with it being in the afternoon, I didn't have any privileges to doing too much until after I married. And that's true to say, because I had my grandparents, I had my auntie, and I had Dick, Tom, and Harry, and everybody was so strict until I thought I was living on quinine. <laughs> I guess they figured if we got out, there'd be something come up that wasn't supposed to be, so they just kept us at the house. Miss Helen, in contrast, was much luckier, since her whole family was into playing ball. The near envy remained in Myrtle Johnson's voice as she nodded in agreement, saying, Oh, I tell you, when Helen's family and their ball team would come to Biggers, oh, I'd sit there on that porch and want to go so bad. They would come to Biggers and go to the ball field, most especially on the 4th of July. They'd go out there on that ball field and play but I didn't get a chance to go. In spite of, or maybe because, of the forget, forbidden status of baseball for Myrtle Johnson, the Biggers team lineup and her obvious pride in her community's players remained with her long after the dust had settled away. There was George Johnson, Henry Stanley, Clarence Stanley, Jack Pittman, Posey Pittman, Frank Washington, E.W. Heron, Sim Johnson, Sam Johnson, Denzel Martin, Nathan Mansker, Roy Rogers, Ollie Johnson, and Smokey James. And if Burdell faced a particularly tough team, the best of the Biggers team were recruited and vice versa. 
For the many African Americans from Randolph County who did get to participate, either as players or as spectators, the pride in the Burdell team was evident and built to a climax when in the late 40s the team sort of hit its peak. By then, many of Randolph County's African Americans would join in that movement known as the Great Migration, as is described in Isabel Wilkerson's wonderful book, The Warmth of Other Suns. They were hoping for better opportunities, relocating to other places near and far. Yet, they would continue to feel a sense of pride and would continue to identify with the Burdell team. And just as the team had once boasted and gloated about their own fastest man on earth, a now much older Charlie Johnson, who had moved to another town, would have the opportunity to return the favor. And here's how Roland McCarroll remembered. In later years, we organized, I guess, the best team we ever had here in Pocahontas. Charlie had moved to Mark Tree. We went there to play, and that was in 47. We had a good team. We were, I don't know, we played about 50 or 60 games, and we only lost two. We went to Mark Tree, and all, I don't know the families that lived in Mark Tree at that time that was from this area, from Walnut Ridge and Pocahontas. And, and then things had gotten a little bit better with us. We had a bus prior to this time. Uh, the team had traveled in the back of an old rented truck. We had a school bus now we traveled in, and we unloaded over there at Mark Tree that day. And, of course, all those people that had lived here at one time, they were glad to see us, you know. They just swarmed that bus when we unloaded. The homeboys is here. The homeboys is here. Why, they just went for us. They didn't have anything to do with Mark Tree. Mark Tree didn't like that, you know. They lived there, but when we unloaded over there, our homeboys is here. Charlie just almost taken over the team. He was our third base coach. We had a good time over there that day. It wasn't good for Mark Tree, though, because they lost, you know. <laughs> he, uh, Charlie just had to have a part in it because his homeboys were there. That's what he told them. The homeboys is here. The homeboys became the team to beat among the local black ball clubs during the 40s. Sort of a Cinderella story. They would come to be known as the Pocahontas All-Stars and even traded their striped overalls for real ball uniforms, white ones, red stripe down the leg, and a black cap with a red bill, courtesy of the Pocahontas merchants. Now, the pride the team had instilled among its own came to also be shared somewhat in the white community. And so wherever they went, they were the team to beat. On one occasion, their first meeting with what was supposed to be a superior West Plains team, the opposing fans, thinking that the game was won, began their chant. And this was the chant. Goodbye, Pocahontas, we hate to see you go. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. You can beat some folks, but you can't beat us. Goodbye, Pocahontas. We hate to see you go. But according to Mr. Rowland, the game took a turn in the last inning, leaving the victory and the song from that game forward for the Pocahontas All-Stars. For Rowland McCarroll, baseball could be a stern teacher, as this account of his experience touching the big leagues illustrates. I wasn't really that familiar with them, that is the players on the Memphis Red Sox team. This was a minor league club for the professional teams, for the professional leagues. But when they came to Newport, remember the national team sometimes came to small towns, and when they came to Newport, we just played them. On one particular occasion, he recalled, it just wasn't organized right. I started against the Red Sox, and we had them beat. We had players picked from Randolph, Lawrence, and Jackson, and Woodruff, those four counties, that I know. And I started against the Red Sox that day. I pitched five innings. The score was three and two. The manager, of course, that's what managers is for, he pulled me. And his boy, 
was catching me, and he talked to his dad when he started making the change. And he said, Dad, why don't you leave Roland in? said, he's one of the best pitchers I've ever caught. said, we've never been in the process of beating the Red Sox, but we've got them beat today. And Newport had a big left-hander, big broad-shouldered guy, and they said he was good. And, and, and he said, no, son, this is the way I've got it planned. Roland has served his turn. At that time, I was 20-some years old, maybe, and I didn't have any bad days, but he pulled me, and those guys just hit the ball, just run the game. They beat us, but we could have won the game. Years went by, and this old man came to me at Newport one day. I was over there, and he said, the only time we was ever in the process of beating the Memphis Red Sox I fooled you. I fooled you and put, he called him Hoss, put him in. I thought he was the best pitcher, but he wasn't. To make matters even harder to take, this game brought Mr. Rowland so close to the big leagues. The Memphis Red Sox offered him a contract wanting him to come to Cincinnati to begin training. But according, and here there's, there are different sources and different accounts of this, but apparently um, there was an injury. Mr. Rowland had some sort of injury. And then another account says that his pay would not begin until he had been under contract with them for a year. Well, Mr. Rowland's life and family responsibilities took priority, and he did not go to Cincinnati. So if you think about it, baseball was not only a source of great pride, but it was for Mr. Rowland, and I know for others, sometimes a poignant reminder of the limitations they faced every day of their lives here in rural Arkansas and in the United States of America in the 30s and 40s. In another place or circumstance, Rowland, schoolboy McCarroll, might have had a chance to live out his boyhood dream, might have made it with the Negro Leagues. Did Mr. Rowland believe? He could have made it, could have, could have succeeded with a team like the Red Sox. Yes, he said, I really do. At that time, you know, I didn't think a lot about it. Now, I know I could have. McCarroll apparently never looked back. Ball playing was not his only passion. For those who knew him and remember, he loved hunting and training those award-winning black and tan coon hounds. He never left his first love, though, and he continued all his life to do what he was so good at doing by adapting as the years passed. He coached softball, helping an all-black girls team, the Water Valley team. Some of you are here tonight. Raise your hands, please, ma'am. And also the Star Herald women's softball team. Is anyone here from that team? And, and he helped them win championships. It was, he was there when the black and white ball teams eventually integrated, and his influence in coaching Little League baseball teams allowed him to extend his legacy even further. Age eventually slowed the pace of his life, but still, Mr. Rowland found his niche on the ball field behind home plate as a longtime umpire who remembers Rowland McCarroll umpiring. Lots of people in this room do. For the Pocahontas Softball Association, one of the things he told me in that interview so long ago gives his life this very indisputable frame of focus. I will tell you this, he said. It has been a game that I always, always loved. I just wish that I could still play. I would not at all be surprised if these men pictured here who are former members of the Verdell and Biggers teams who were gathered for a reunion would echo that statement. Kneeling from left are Ernest McCarroll, Melvin Young, Marvin Looney, Mr. Rowland, Ted Looney, and standing from left, Ed Young, 
Skeet Williford, Harrison Rainey, John Shockley, Frank Roddy, and Alonzo Fat, jo Fat Jack Thomas. In so many ways, as the book by Robert Peterson, Only the Ball Was White, as that book shows, the function of sport, and the Negro Leagues in particular, parallel the functions that the Burdell Ball Club of the 30s and 40s also played. That team, first and foremost, was a shaper of identity, both for the individual player and collectively for the African American community, especially the black community that existed at a, as a small demographic entity in an otherwise all-white society in the Jim Crow South. The big games on Saturdays and Sundays, and especially on the 4th of July, served as an entertaining interval of a needed respite in an existence generally marked with hard work. And oppression. And if for only a short time, the ball field and all its trappings became a metaphor for life, as, as it might have been, a place of perfection, a, a world where Pearl Young and others got to set the boundaries, got to place the stakes, and where everyone on the field and off got to play a part. The art of playing baseball, whether at Burdell or Memphis or Kansas City or Hoboken, New York, provided opportunity for self-knowledge and for an understanding, even if it was sometimes painful, of society itself. And it provided for the players and the fans also that euphoria of feeling, no, not just feeling, of being, for a while, champions. Those ball games really were played on the size and the hoops and hollers of the fans at Burdell and the other small towns as they crowded those baselines. Their hearts and their souls just flying around those bases with Schoolboy and Charlie Johnson and Fat Jack and Pony Williford and all the other heroes of the Burdell colored boys. The sandlot out at Burdell may have been dusty, but this nevertheless was a diamond. It was a diamond with a sparkle, bringing a great measure of joy and fame to those who rounded the bases. And no spectators anywhere could have cheered any louder, could have been any prouder of their team. No mere game ever wielded greater impact, building community across boundaries and creating a sense of connection that has outlasted time. These games were in some ways almost like a lifeblood for Roland McCarroll and his teammates and the opponents who for years to come would tell their children and their grandchildren stories about how great it was, how fast they ran, how far they jumped and how hard they slugged. The connections, the memories continue even to this day. They are a link for African Americans from communities all around the region, a way to know people simply because the stories about them still live. By the mid-50s, the all-black baseball teams were a vanishing phenomenon here as well as on the national scene. But this one final indisputable truth from Roland Carroll remains. Black boys we had back then in this part of the country, we had nowhere to go. We just play ball. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you care to take a few questions? John, are we up for a few questions? <laughs> <laughs> sure, we'll do our best. I'll try. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Or comments. I'm, I'm, I'm truly not an expert, and this is based on the interview with Mr. Rowland and Miss Helen and Miss Myrtle, it is not all encompassing, so you may well have pieces of the story that I don't have. And if you would like to add anything or question, have any questions, I'd be happy to hear hear from you at this time. Are they the ones who played down on the old ball field down where the city 
uh, waterworks and the street department is now. Now, John, did you hear the question? It's I, think I think that was a little bad. Yeah, we I, I was think... the one. <laughs> 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 Shirley, when, when were those games played the down there on that ball field? That they, they were out there in the uh, early 60s. 60s, she talking about. No, okay. no, no, I was talking about in the 40s. Oh, no, 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 they were no. That's for our time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, Margaret says in the 40s, that Burdell. this group Burdell. was still playing at Burdell. Yes. So if yes. there were teams playing on that field, it would not have been this team. No. Okay. Well, that was okay. the gun. But this team did play down there on the old ball dime, and I've sat down there many times with my daddy in the after Sunday afternoons up on the hillside. And I remember Roland McCarroll and then we talked about Roland, and they played down there. So that would have been probably early 40s. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Anybody got an easy question? Questions are not designed. And I'm so pleased to have uh, family members here, and I hope that I did justice to um, Mr. Rowland and, and Miss Helen. And Yes, Pat? I just wanted to have a comment and say to thank you so much for honoring Mr. Rowland and Miss Helen and Miss Myrtle for their times, their stories that they told. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's not hard to honor someone like Mr. Rowland and Miss Helen and um, my dad. Always, I, I've I've never known a more respected man in this community ever than was Roland McCarroll. Well deserved and very respected, a leader, and we are all the better for having someone like Roland McCarroll and his family be a part of this community. I Thank really you. believe that. Yeah. Any other comments, any other questions? Thank you for the opportunity to share this and uh, uh, it is a part of our history and we must not ever let it go away. Thank you. Thank you, Jan.